Good luck, everyone. Just letting a couple of people get into the room tonight. Thanks for joining us. And we'll start in just by 10 more seconds here. See people joining us right now. All right. Good evening and welcome. I'm Kevin Edwards of Allied Physicians Group. Thank you for joining our webinar titled Asthma Control Education, ACE as we like to call it, going back to school safely with asthma. We hope the webinar will provide you with valuable tools and information. We have a few housekeeping rules to hang up before we get going here. We'll have time to end for our questions and answers. Most of you have sent in your questions already. If you have additional questions, please send us them using the Q&A feature located at the bottom of the screen, and we'll address as many as we can. Following this webinar, we will send you a link so you can view it again or share with others, as well as we'll be sending you some valuable information, stuff that we'll be going over during this webinar. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Kerry Firestein, CEO of Allied Physicians Group. Thank you, Kevin. Hi, everybody. I'm Kerry Firestein, Chief Executive Officer of Allied Physicians Group, practicing pediatrician for 30 years, mother of three, and grandmother of one. The COVID pandemic is filled with many unknowns, and the unknowns are scary, especially when it has to do with our children. Um, and we think it's putting our children at risk. That's why Allied is committed to giving information out to um, our families as soon as we know it, in whatever way we know it. This is our 13th webinar. We've covered asthma before, but this one is specifically for asthma. For those of you who don't know Allied Physicians Group, we're the largest independent pediatric group in Lower New York with practices across Long Island, Suffolk, the boroughs, Westchester, and even into Orange County. Um, we have some specialists as well who you're going to meet tonight. As we all leave our pandemic, our quarantine bubble, there's a lot of anxiety and specifically related to going back to school and going back to school for children with asthma. The webinar tonight is gonna to answer a lot of those questions, the ones that you sent into us when you registered. Anything that we don't answer in the general presentation, we will try to answer at the end, as well as any questions that you submit to us during the presentation. I'm gonna now introduce our panel of experts. So Robin Kreiner. Can you introduce yourself, please, Dr. Kreiner? Hi, everybody. I'm Robin Kreiner. I'm a physician at Strauss Allergy and Asthma, specializing in allergy and asthma. I'm a mother of three young kids and a grandmother to none. <laughs> um, Dr. Ralph Strauss. <clears throat> Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ralph Strauss. I have been in practice in allergy, asthma, and immunology for the past 30 years. I'm also the father of three adult kids and uh, no grandchildren that I know of yet. Michelle Ruck. Hi, my name is Michelle Ruck and I have been in the pediatric field for 42 years. I've been a pediatric nurse practitioner for more than 27 and more than half of those years I have worked for Allied. I am also a certified asthma educator and I have asthma. I have three adult children and no grandchildren yet. I guess having grandchildren has become, you know, one of the things we talk about. Um, Erica, <clears throat> I'm guessing you have no grandchildren, but please tell us um, about your lovely child. 
Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. I am Erica Singer. I am physician assistant for Allied Physicians Group. Um, I'm the rookie of the group, but I have been with Allied Physicians Group for uh, going on nine years now. Um, and I see nutrition patients and uh, I do asthma education as well. And your child? I do have a daughter. She turned one in June. Okay, I'm gonna hand things over to Dr. Strauss, who is going to um, give us a lot of great information. Good evening and welcome again. Um, we've been dealing with the corona pandemic now for about six months. We know you're stressed, anxious, and very concerned about what will happen in the fall as we try to get our kids back to school. I admit there are too many unanswered questions and too much uncertainty. However, we're gonna to try to address your concerns and questions as best we can. As you listen to this webinar, as you've heard, we are all also parents and wanna help you make the right decisions for your children based on our current knowledge. The good news is that we have a lot of data and the scientific research dedicated to coronavirus is unprecedented. However, we're here with a great deal of humility, understanding that we don't have all the answers and realizing that like all of science and medicine, our recommendations will change over time as the data changes. I'll give you an example from my own life. I grew up in the 1960s. As an infant and a child, I rode in the car without a car seat or a seat belt in the front seat whenever I could get it. My parents were not horrible people but they would be accused of child abuse if they allowed that in the 21st century. That was simply the standard back then. Life is never risk-free. Each of us as people and parents accept and live with different degrees of risk. These decisions need to be rational and not based on fear. So let's talk specifically about what asthma is. It's the most common chronic disease in children. The diagnosis is often delayed. A lot of times you bring your kid in with a cough or a wheeze and the pediatrician, rightly so, is not willing to call it asthma just yet. But once the diagnosis is made, the survey studies show for children and adults, over half of patients with asthma are not considered well controlled. They could do better. The goals of asthma treatment are to make you or your child feel like you don't have asthma. There should not be any restrictions on activities. And more than that, you wanna re reduce the risk of future asthma attacks or exacerbations. As I mentioned at the outset, I've been doing this for a long time and asthma management has changed. We used to rely a lot on albuterol as our first line bronchodilator or reliever drugs these medications make you feel better right away when you take them. However, more and more we've come to learn that the best asthma medications for mild to moderate patients are the medicines that control or prevent symptoms. Those are mostly inhaled steroid medications and we'll talk about how safe and effective they are over the course of this webinar. It's also important to remember that asthma treatment plans have to be individualized. You can't just look at what we're presenting tonight and say, ah, that must be the right plan for me and my kid. That's what I wanna do. You have to talk this over with your doctor. So what do we know about asthma in regards to the new novel coronavirus 19? We know in general that children are at low risk from the really bad complications for coronavirus. We've also learned that mild to moderate asthma is really doesn't increase the risk of hospitalization or death. That's good news. The CDC still lists moderate to severe persistent asthma as a possible risk factor, but the data behind that are not very conclusive. <clears throat> Again, it's a possibility. In the start of this pandemic, when we talked about asthma medications, we had some concerns, particularly about the oral or systemic steroids. What we have learned in a very robust amount of uh, data and information is that asthma medications are very safe to use and should be used aggressively as recommended. 
this, it has never been more important to make sure that asthma is under really good control and the medications are really very safe. We've had a lot of questions for this webinar and in our offices about masks. We, uh, it is difficult to get used to wearing a mask, <clears throat> but we've all learned to do it. And our children can learn to do it as well. Masks do not compromise breathing and they do not pose any special risk to patients with asthma. It may take some getting used to. You may wanna try different masks and find what works best for your child, but a layered cloth mask is fine. Um, we've learned that bandanas and visors are not effective at preventing the spread of coronavirus, so those should not be used. But you can practice with your child picking out what mask they're comfortable with and trying to gradually increase the amount of time that they wear it. There have been some changes because of this pandemic. The standard of care that we use to follow patients with asthma is pulmonary function testing or spirometry. That's when you or your child blows into a computer as hard as they can so we can measure lung capacity or lung function. The problem with that is if somebody happened to have coronavirus, they would contaminate the equipment. So that is no longer something that is routinely used. Additionally, if somebody came to the office with an asthma exacerbation, we might give them a nebulizer treatment. That's something we are avoiding. Compressor-driven nebulizers are really good at aerosolizing medication. They're also good at aerosolizing viruses. So we do not use them in hospital or office settings. If your child is comfortable using one in your home, that's okay. Uh, let's face it, if, if they're sick, you're gonna be exposed to whatever germs they have as their caregiver. Let's go to the next slide. Um, as we go through this webinar and talk about good asthma management, it always makes sense to talk about actual people, actual patients. So let's start out with a couple of kids that we've seen in the office recently. This is Jackson. He's a six-year-old who's gonna be going into first grade. He uses the nebulizer with albuterol whenever he gets a cold, and that's several times a year. He missed a couple of weeks of school last year. He was hospitalized once with a wheezing episode with pneumonia at the age of three. In between episodes, he's absolutely fine. He can run with the best of them but he does get sneezing, runny nose, and a cough in the spring, and whenever he visits a house with a dog. His parents have several concerns. The number one worry, what is, whether it's safe for him to go to school this fall. But last year, his pediatrician wanted him to take one of these controller medications called Pomacord, or budesonide, in the nebulizer. But mom thought that was too much medicine, was concerned about giving him steroids daily. Let's meet our next patient. Can we have the next slide? So this is Samantha. Samantha is a typical teenager who loves to run track. So she uses her inhaler every time she runs and does well with it. A Couple of times a year she'll get sick and her asthma will flare up and she'll use her albuterol inhaler a bit more. She's been great this summer because she hasn't been running much. So she hasn't needed her inhaler much. She has a cat at her house, but doesn't think that causes any problems. Her parents are concerned about her because she doesn't always wear a mask when she hangs out with her friends, when she goes to the beach or at their homes. And they've also caught her vaping a couple of times. So I'm gonna turn this over to my associate, Michelle, who's gonna talk about what constitutes really good asthma management. Hi, everyone. So, I'm gonna discuss with you the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how of controlling asthma so that your child can safely return to school. The most important message I want you to know is the, for asthma, the goal is control. So you're gonna hear us say that over and over and over again. In terms of understanding the diagnosis and the overview of asthma medications and the asthma action plan, that is something that we're going to share with you when you make an appointment for an asthma education session 
with either myself or Erica or whomever you choose to have that educational session with. Um, next slide, please. Children, the who, children with wheezing or coughing attacks require fast acting, also called rescue relievers, like albuterol several times during a year or surrounding exertional activities such as sports or dance, like our case, Samantha, we were discussing. What? As we've heard, asthma is the most common childhood chronic respiratory illness, and it is caused by three distinct features, swelling, extra mucus production, and a tight twitchy airway, which triggers that chronic cough that we're so accustomed to hearing, which tends to be juicy or tight. Does this mean that they will be sick all the time? Absolutely not, but only when they're well controlled. When? Parents are seeking our guidance as to when to seek regular versus urgent medical care. And there's an excellent guideline called the rule of twos. So let's remember our case, Samantha. She seemed to need her albuterol before every exertional activity which was known to be her trigger, such as gym or sports. One of the things that I would like families to learn is the rule of twos, which is simply this. It's a very simple rule and it's a guideline for younger children, but it goes like this. If you need to use your fast acting albuterol rescue reliever more than two times a week when the child is awake, like our Samantha case, or they are waking up more than twice a month at night needing it, then they've exceeded the rule of twos. And that's our guideline for knowing that that child will need a medical evaluation in consideration of starting the inhaled corticosteroids daily for a time or a season. It doesn't have to be 365 days a year. It might be six to eight weeks at a time. Families hear that word steroids and they become alarmed, thinking this, that steroids are the same as like taking the pill or the liquid form by mouth. However, it's, we want you to understand that inhaled types are so weak that they actually need to be taken daily with minimal side effects and they don't cause harm, but they need to be taken daily. The key message here is that we would like parents to know the difference between the many different inhaler prescription types. There's the fast acting rescue reliever albuterol, which is to be used hopefully rarely to relieve an attack, while the inhaled steroids are to be used daily to achieve control, control to prevent the asthma attack. Next, so those are examples of inhaled steroids are Flovent, Qvar, Asmonex, Symbacort, Dulera, and Advair. The next slide, please. So what, where? Allied Pediatric Partners offer telemed visits before school starts, and we would like to recommend that every three months is very ideal to jointly assess children's asthma control so that we can develop plans to manage, to manage it between visits for continued sports and exertional extracurricular participation. In a little while, you're going to meet another asthma educator in this webinar named Erica. Asthma educators assist families in partnership as a team with your primary care providers allergists and pulmonologists to help you manage this chronic illness so that your child can remain active, healthy, and thrive during this pandemic and the future. And the next slide is why. In view of this pandemic, we can help you develop plans to avoid future attacks and to manage or minimize the very few that may still occur. We view ourselves as navigators to your child's health, while you are the pilots and the co-pilots. We will teach you how to transition from nebulizers, which can spread infection, to puffers with spacers. Scientific evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, and Hurricane Sandy taught us that puffers with spacers 
are equally as effective as nebulizers when used correctly, delivering the prescription deeper into the smaller airways of the lungs, acting faster therefore, and they also require no electricity. And they're done like that. The next slide is how. New clinical evidence has instructed us in this field that starting inhaled steroids sooner is safer than using fast-acting albuterol too often, or in the case of the rule of twos, greater than two times a week in the day, or needing to wake up more than two times a month at night to use it. So what now? Allied wants to assist and support families in best practices asthma management and to take advantage of telemed visits from the comfort of your own home without exposure or risk from the healthcare setting before school starts for asthma control educational sessions. Thank you. So we've heard from Michelle um, what asthma is and who it affects. So now you might be asking yourself, does my child have good control of their asthma? And what exactly does good control mean? Of course, asthma, the goal is to achieve control. So we'd like to treat asthma before the attack. As Michelle has outlined, um, asthma control is when we're getting symptoms less than twice a week or less than twice a month at night. So your child is using their rescue inhaler more than that, that would be qualified as uncontrolled asthma. A well-controlled asthmatic should have a quality of life equal to that of someone without asthma. They should be able to participate in all normal activities, sports, active play, running around with friends, and they should have uninterrupted sleep. Normal activities would also include going back to school. And in our case of Jackson, we should not be missing school. He's missed two weeks of kindergarten, so that might qualify as uncontrolled asthma and he might need better management. Of course, your asthma management is done by a team, so we've addressed that a little bit already. Usually the asthma diagnosis begins with your pediatrician. So you might take your child to see the doctor um, if they start experiencing breathing symptoms. Um, and you'll discuss the asthma workup. Your pediatrician, um, definitely through Allied, would then refer you to an asthma educator like myself or Michelle. In other practices, it might be another asthma educator. And during these asthma education visits, we try to educate the patient and the parent on the disease process. So what exactly is asthma? We then go and play a little bit of a detective game, I guess you could say, and we try to identify the patient's triggers. So we will uh, use a trigger tracker, if you can pull up that photo. Back to the previous slide, I'm sorry. I just need the trigger tracker photo up. So this trigger tracker um, is a way for patients to identify their triggers. So they will track when they get symptoms to correlate it to anything that might be going on in their environment. Common triggers, um, upper, upper respiratory infections, excuse me, or outdoor allergens, for example. And we go through these trigger trackers when they bring them back to their visits. If the trigger tracker is completely filled out, that means they've had five episodes of needing uh, rescue medication, in which case they might need better management. After we go through uh, the trigger tracker, you can go back, um, we might also go through some medical management discussing the difference between using a nebulizer versus an inhaler and even trying to, especially in these times, start children younger on that inhaler use. Um, it's certainly easier to carry around, like Michelle pointed out, it does not require power. So for losing power, it's still usable. Um, and we also go through the difference between inhalers, whether it be a rescue medication or an inhaled steroid controller medication. And we assess control at every visit. So is the patient using their medication too much? Do they need better uh, medical management to control their asthma? Lastly, we consider the referral to a specialist. Um, every patient is different. Some patients with asthma see specialists earlier on in their disease process. 
and some patients, it might be later on for further, more detailed workup. Next slide, please. Now, to achieve control of asthma, there are key points that we go over. Um, as Michelle had pointed out, we do tend to uh, fill out asthma action plans at every visit, first in the beginning of diagnosis, and then throughout the disease process as things might change. And that asthma action plan outlines for the patient and the parent what treatment correlates to what symptoms. So as you can see here, um, it's designated in terms of green, yellow, and red. And depending on the symptoms that uh, outlines, I'm sorry, instructs uh, the family which treatment to give. Um, now, the asthma action plan should be kept in our asthma kit. This asthma kit, I have mine here, if you can see this, inside should have our asthma action plan and our spacer and any inhalers we may use. This kit should be kept at home, at school, in a backpack or with a school nurse. Um, in a, in a sports bag with coaches, anyone that might be uh, facilitating the use of these medications with the child. It is very important that it also contains that asthma action plan so everyone knows what to do. As Michelle pointed out previously, we must also know the difference between our medications, both quick acting and long acting. Um, and this is something that we would go over in an asthma education visit to make sure the child themselves knows the medications. We also, uh, in detail, go through how to use the inhalers properly. Um, and there are two main types of inhalers that we tend to prescribe. Um, the first is a manual meter dosed inhaler, and that's the one that comes with the spacer. Um, Michelle nicknamed that the puffer. Um, and then we also have a breath activated or dry powder inhaler. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, you'll see a short clip on uh, inhaler use. How to use your inhaler and spacer. Shake the inhaler for 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Ten. Take the cap off the inhaler. Ensure the cap is off the spacer. Attach to spacer. Breathe out all the way. Close lips around mouthpiece. Press down on the inhaler. Breathe in slow and deep. Hold your breath for 10 seconds if you can. Then breathe out slowly. If you need another puff of medicine, wait one minute, then repeat the process. Terrific. Now you might be asking yourself, what should I do now? How can I be prepared? So the new recommendation with Allied is to schedule a back to school telemedicine asthma visit in which we will go over many of the things we're talking about in tonight's presentation to make sure your child is controlled and ready to go back to school. Asthma well care visits, just like this asthma back to school visit, are uh, meant for preventing future attacks. So again, we wanna make sure your child has controlled asthma. Uh, and these are recommended every four months. For an uncontrolled asthmatic, it would happen more frequently. Um, right now they're being done through telemedicine, so it's like a virtual visit. And in our experience, they have been super successful and parents and patients tend to very uh, much like them. Um, there's also asthma office visits for more acute care if your child is showing symptoms. Um, last but not least, we would consider specialist follow-up um, for further workup if it's needed. And with that, I will turn to one of our specialists, Dr. Kreiner. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Robin Kreiner. Again, I'm an asthma and allergy specialist at Strauss Allergy and Asthma. I've got three young kids who just turned one, seven, and five, not in that order. Um, but as you know, and as you can see, I'm a parent, and, um, so I see it from the parent side, and I also see it from the medical side. So I'm honored to be here alongside these wonderful, knowledgeable individuals. And I wanted to emphasize again that there is no exact right answer for everything, but the information that we're giving you is the most up-to-date information that we have and have learned thus far for the novel coronavirus. 
Um, and as you can see, it's ever-changing information on a week-to-week -week basis. We find some new information. And to reiterate, well-controlled asthma is not an increased risk of COVID infection or hospitalization. And asthma medications are safe to use when used properly and as prescribed. So let's go back to our first case, Jackson. He's been seen in our office. And as a specialist, we usually do allergy testing to see if there's any extrinsic or environmental factors that might be causing symptoms. So for Jackson, we've tested him and he's positive to tree pollen, dust mites, and dog. We've briefly discussed allergy immunotherapy or allergy shots for him to see if that's an option. And we've gone over his triggers to see if we can eliminate them from his environment. So as you can see from Erica and Michelle, they went over rescue medication and controller medication. And for Jackson, we've decided that he has persistent asthma based on his symptoms and his several illnesses a year. And we've prescribed a daily inhaled steroid. And as we see here, we've prescribed Flovent to be um, started in the fall. And as a lot of parents have this hesitation to starting budesonide or an, or, or an inhaled steroid like Jackson's mother, we want to let you know that a localized steroid to the lungs has many less side effects than an oral or systemic steroid. And this daily inhaler will help prevent flares, sleepless nights, missed days, or even weeks of school, and also oral steroid courses, which have many more side effects than inhaled steroids that we've discussed prior. <clears throat> so for Jackson, remember, prevention is key and starting before the winter months will help him. And it's important um, to reemphasize that you have to have an individualized plan for each patient because no patient is the same. And we'll then reassess every three months to assess their symptoms and control so that we can taper the medication to the lowest effective dose. Next slide. So the next slide that we have is going to be Samantha, who we discussed prior. And for her, seeing a specialist helps to see, again, if there's any extrinsic or environmental factors that might be, you know, she might be exposed to. So after testing, we see that she's allergic to cat, which is actually a constant daily exposure for her. And also, we see that she runs track, so she's using her inhaler more than twice a week. And we saw that Michelle, as Michelle said, more than twice a week, you are not under control. So we've discussed with Samantha and her family that using an inhaled steroid and long-acting albuterol combination would benefit her. So for her, we recommend using it about 20 minutes or so before practice, and she can even use it up to twice daily. Now, Simbaport is a combination medication, again, with an inhaled steroid and a long-acting albuterol. And other medications that you may have heard of include Advair, Brio, Dulera are also some comparable medications. Now, if you remember from Dr. Strauss, Samantha likes to go out. She likes to go to people's houses in large group settings with masks. Now, some teenagers, for those of you that have teenage kids, I do not, but those of you who have teenage kids, some of them like to exert their independence. They want to see their friends. They want to be social. And we have to emphasize to them the importance of wearing a mask in large gatherings or even not going to these large gatherings. It can also infect themselves and they can also infect or give the coronavirus to others around them, especially their family members. So we wanna make sure that we talk to them in a calm manner, not yelling at them or disciplining them, but try to talk to them in a calm manner to let them know that large group settings at this point in time are better off not done and to stay home and, you know, shelter in place to prevent the spread. Also vaping, we found that she's vaping on occasion and vaping also has its own risks. So studies have shown that about 25% of kids use e-cigarettes and 20% of kids vape or smoke regularly. Now this can result in a quick addiction and it's not easy to just stop. So for Samantha, this will also not help her track performance. So we have to reemphasize that vaping is not, you know, good behavior for these teenage kids or even the younger individuals. Smoking or vaping can actually increase risk of COVID-19 infection because it lowers the lungs immune response. So you want to make sure that you're discussing this behavior with kids and have an open communication. But from a provider standpoint, nicotine replacement therapy actually 
doubles the smoker or vapor's chance of quitting, and it's relatively safe to be used in kids. And we can talk about this further if you have any concerns with an office or telemed vis visit. And these are just two of many different scenarios in terms of asthma management and asthma medication use. And again, there are many other different scenarios, which is a perfect opportunity to set up a back to school appointment via telemedicine to discuss options, symptoms, and control with your provider about your children. So we want you to know that we're here to help you. We're here to listen. Um, we always love seeing your smiling faces. And we hope so far this has provided some information going into the 2020 school year and tried to kind of you know, alleviate some of the stresses, even though it can be very stressful going into the school year with the unknown and unexpected. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and answer some questions that have come in prior and during the talk. Thank you, panel. This was great. Um, there have been a lot of questions that have come in. I've answered a lot of them. Um, spacers. It seems that the concept of spacers are new to a lot of our parents. Um, so, Michelle, can you tell us what is the point? So these are the questions. What is the point of a spacer? Um, and at what age can you stop using a spacer? Never stop using a spacer. <laughs> Uh, research has been done where they um, actually marked the medication with a fluoros fluoroscopic um, tracer. Tracer, yes. And they used um, fluoroscopy to trace what happens when you press the meter dosed inhaler and where it goes, where it deposits. And it has turned out that less than half the dose, only 40% of the dose, when you use it without a spacer goes into the lungs, the smaller airways. In fact, 60% of it lands in the back of the throat or the tongue. Therefore, it is, it, parents say to us all the time, the medicine doesn't work, I need the nebulizer. I need the nebulizer because those puffers don't work. They call them puffers. <clears throat> However, if they use a spacer, the majority of the medicine gets into the lungs. The reason is those puffers travel mostly at 90 miles an hour. At 90 miles an hour without the spacer to aerosolize the medicine and get it suspended to suck into the lungs, it actually just deposits in the back of the throat. It doesn't work there. Thank you. What's the youngest age that you've been able to get a child to use a spacer? Infants, six month olds. You use a mask and in a way it's kind of probably seems mean, but as they're screaming and crying because they don't like the mask on their face, they're sucking that medicine right down into their lungs and it works. We learned this during Hurricane Sandy when all of our little asthmatics and our little wheezers had no electricity and we had no other option, so we started using it. And then it's been many years since Hurricane Sandy, but research has validated in fact that it is equally as effective the um, puffers with spacers and masks are equally as effective when used properly, but it needs to be taught. Thank you. Um, there were some questions about tips for using a spacer for, I'm, they didn't say the age, I'm assuming we're talking toddlers. I'm gonna make the suggestion and um, Erica, you can um, agree with me or not, that you guys have a lot of good tips for using that, right? For helping a three-year-old use a spacer, and that would be one of the things that you might work um, through during, um, a t well, actually, we have to talk about it during a telemed, right? You guys are doing most Definitely. I mean, in the office and through telemed, we go through demonstration, and we actually have the patients, young or old, doesn't really matter, practice using the spacer with or without the medication, depending on the time. And, you know, they'll show us how they're using it. Lots of times it demonstrates to us if they're using it incorrectly and we can correct them. And similar to the discussion of masks and getting used to it, I do think that becoming familiar with the spacer and the inhaler is important. If a child sees that thing broken out, you know, when they're screaming and crying, they're not going to want anything to do with it. But if they see it and they're practicing with it when they're calm, I think it makes them feel much more comfortable. And like anything, right? Let them practice with a doll. Let them yeah. be the 
the mommy um, or the doctor and administer to the doll, it becomes a lot less scary for them. Yes, and I always try to remind parents that are afraid of the inhalers at such a young age, the time it takes to administer the medication through a spacer and inhaler is much, much shorter than the 20 minutes it takes on the nebulizer machine. So if you don't wanna hear your kids screaming and crying for 20 minutes on the nebulizer, teach them how to use the inhalers. Absolutely. Now, from a pediatric perspective, I want to tell all the parents that when you come to your checkups, you should bring whatever medication you take, including your asthma medication, and bring your spacer because we'll take that opportunity to see how you use it, how the child uses it. And now during COVID, if your child comes in in an acute episode, please bring your spacer and your inhalers because we cannot give you a nebulizer in the office. Um, what we can do in the office with the spacer is give you more puffs than you would give at home. And that's the same thing that they would do in the hospital. Correct, Dr. Strauss? Yeah, one of the reasons that people think that the nebulizer works better is you're getting more medicine. So if you give more puffs, you're getting the equivalent of a nebulizer treatment. But parents should stick to how many puffs at home? Um, you know, it depends on your asthma action plan. Um, two puffs every four hours is, is the limit before you should contact your doctor and talk about what's going on. But sometimes under guidance, we'll have patients give four to eight puffs at a, at a time rather than go to the emergency room or, uh, or an urgent care center. Right. Under guidance, I think, is the key word there. Right. And it's never been easier with telemedicine. You can get on the phone with your doctor and you can get an immediate visit sometimes and just we can see how your child is actually breathing and give you advice right, right there. Yeah, and Allied also has telemedicine available from 6.30 to 10.30 every night, um, you know, seven days a week so that if your child has an asthma episode at night, not only can you get a lot of the pediatricians on the phone, but somebody could actually watch your child breathe, which I think makes a huge difference um, for the doctor to feel more comfortable and also for the parent to know that, no, they actually are seeing how my child's breathing and it is okay. Um, Dr. Kreiner, somebody asked about Singulair or Montelukast. Can you talk about that as a controller? So Montelukast or Singulair is a medication or a tablet that is usually prescribed to be taken at night. It can help with allergies, it can help with asthma, and it can also help with exercise-induced symptoms. Um, some antihistamine, or some people think it can be used in replacement of an inhaler, which sometimes it can, but it is an anti-leukotriene inhibitor, so it affects other pathways that are involved with allergy. So if patients are not responsive to inhalers or they have other underlying symptoms or triggers, this is definitely a medication to be um, you know, sought out or discussed to see if that's an option for many patients. So can it work as a controller for some it patients? Can. Yeah, they can. Some people actually respond very well to it um, alone. And then again, you know, we follow up every so often to assess control and symptoms to see if anything needs to be added or tapered down. Now, um, Dr. Carney, you mentioned exercise. So a lot of parents come in and say, my child has exercise-induced asthma. So where does that fit in to the spectrum here? Um, and if they're exercising six days a week and taking that rescue inhaler six days a week, is that okay? Right, so again, it's an individualized plan. And so if a patient's using their inhaler six times a week, seven times a week, then that would be a great patient to add on a daily inhaler such as Simbacort or even Brio, which is a, a daily inhaled steroid and a long acting albuterol, which some of the long acting albuterol medications have a fast acting onset as well as um, a, sh a short, uh, fast onset as well as a prolonged onset of action. Great. Um, lots and lots of questions about masks. I think you handled most of them. So, you know, the take home message is there is no reason that a child with asthma cannot wear a mask all day long. And I know, Michelle, you, you have asthma. So how do you do in your mask? So I have to wear, first of all, I'm in the age group. I'm over 60. <clears throat> I have asthma. You heard me just clearing my throat. And I have to wear a mask all day, 
hours and hours and hours at a time, and it has never triggered my asthma. What triggers my asthma is certain aeroallergens, which come out this time of year, which in fact it has done. And I typically don't restart my controller until about the last week in August. Well, because the weather, I mean, I challenge anyone to tell me that we've really been in July, August weather, we've really been, it's like we're starting the fall early. I had to resume taking my controller, which is a dual action controller, it's Symbicort. I had to take it three weeks ago in order to achieve control, which typically I don't have to do in the month of August. And I wear a mask all day, every day, and it does not trigger my asthma. I'll admit I don't like it. I'll admit that I sweat. I'll admit that I have to take bathroom breaks and I just pull it off, put it back on, but I go back to work. It's fine. It has not in any way affected my asthma. I've been wearing a mask since mid-March every day. Thank you. Um, you mentioned breaks. Dr. Strauss, is there any official recommendation for having you know, mask breaks? Um, I don't think that you have to take a mask break. I think it's, you know, during the course of the day, as Michelle pointed out, when we're wearing them for long periods of time, it's nice to take it off once in a while in certain spaces. And I think some of the schools have accounted for that as well. Excellent. Um, so masks in general, do you guys, Erica, do you have any tips for getting um, a child to wear a mask? I would say practice, just like we talked about uh, the spacer with the inhaler, we have to practice and get comfortable wearing a mask. I mean, we all can agree that mask wearing um, is unfamiliar to us, but now it is a new norm and important for protection. So as adults, as kids, we have to certainly make it a priority. So start wearing it around the house, you know, before school even starts. Um, kids that love to play games, you know, put a timer on and have them wear the mask and start extending that time a little bit more each day so they can grow more comfortable. Yeah, one of the great tips that I heard that I've shared and a few patients have used already, especially with the older kids, if they like to play video games or they like electronics, their phone, tell them they can only do them when they're wearing the mask. And I bet they're gonna learn to wear that mask for longer and longer. Um, either that or they'll play less electronics, so either way you win, right? <laughs> yes. The other thing I, I just wanted to say, I think kids get their cues from parents as well. So if you're worried about them wearing a mask, if you're anxious about it, then, then they become anxious about it. Um, are you seeing, um, Dr. Kreiner, a lot of anxiety in your patients that is masking as perhaps respiratory distress? We are seeing a lot of anxiety, pediatrics and adult population with this. I've had a lot of patients who say since mid-March, they've had chest tightness. Um, honestly, I've heard, I've heard pediatrics, you know, they've had a cough for a long time. And, you know, the difficult thing is we don't really know what it is because if there's no other symptoms, you know, we're not jumping to always get a test because some people haven't left their house in three to four months. So yes, I do think there is a big component of mental health that needs to be addressed, especially from the pediatric standpoint, as well as even adults. I think, you know, at this point, um, the stress of the unknown is triggering symptoms. That slight sore throat that you might have, you know, kind of exacerbates the symptoms. Even myself on a day-to-day -day basis, I get a little bit of a sore throat from wearing a mask for eight hours and wonder if, wonder if it's COVID. But we have to, you know, educate parents and educate patients what symptoms to look out for. We have to practice good hygiene techniques, um, you know, hand washing, promoting good hand washing behavior, um, and wearing a mask, like you said before, is, you know, the best prevention method right now, um, both in and out of, you know, the house, in and out of school and things like that. So yes, the answer is a lot of anxiety, which I do think is manifesting in some respiratory symptoms. Um, we get calls every day from some teachers who are anxious to go back to school. Their asthma is flaring. It's hard to decipher, you know, whether it's, anxiety that's triggering it or a true asthma exacerbation. So we have to, you know, follow those patients closely and reassure them. So I will give a plug. Allied is going to do specifically a back to school mental health webinar on September 3rd. So if you're anxious, if you're anxious about your children going back, if you're a teacher, whatever that is, 
Um, we'll put out some social media stuff on that. And when we send the follow-up to this email, there'll be a link to register for that. Um, but Dr. Carney, you mentioned adult patients. So somebody was asking, um, do you guys see adults? And how do they make an appointment with you? Where so are you we located see, also, they asked. Yeah, so we're located virtually because you can schedule a telemedicine visit from anywhere in New York. You don't have to be near either office, but our actual office locations are in Westbury and Comac. And you can Google us. We have a Facebook page, Strauss Allergy and Asthma. Um, you can call both of our offices. You know, we answer all the phone calls. Every new visit is a telemedicine visit um, to assess symptoms, um, especially what your issues are. And if we need to, we'll bring you into the office. But the wonderful thing about telemedicine is that the history that we would obtain over the phone with a video chat similar to this is the same uh, history we would obtain in the office and we can help do, you know, 90, 80 to 90% of the visit is a clinical history. So we get a good amount of information from what the patient or the child tells us. So they can schedule a telemedicine visit first and we can discuss management and treatment over the phone. Um, and, you know, we're accepting all patients from zero to 150 and we see everybody. So, you know, both Dr. Strauss and I, and we have a pediatric pulmonologist in our office as well, Dr. Khaled Ahmad, who's wonderful as well. Um, and if I can also make a plug for both pediatrics and adults, um, at this time more than ever, it's very important to get your flu shot. You know, when the flu shots are available, you wanna make sure that, you know, you're contacting your pediatric office, figuring out the plan for getting it the safest um, and most efficient way possible. Thank you. And a lot of the pediatric groups have just gotten their flu in. so. While the normal walk-in clinics are going to have to be rethought, um, I would imagine in September, most of the allied practices are going to start to send out some information. Um, so speaking of, of vaccines and immune system, Dr. Strauss, what else can people do to keep their immune system up? Um, I've been studying immunology for probably about 40 years, and the short answer is it's complicated. There are a lot of suggestions out there about supplements and herbal remedies, but my short answer is good health doesn't come in a bottle. You have to do the right thing. You have to pay attention to nutrition. Make sure you're eating a good diet with plenty of fruits and vegetables. Make sure you and your family are getting lots of exercise. It's, you gotta be a little creative now in the pandemic. Gyms are closed. You gotta get outside when you can. Um, make sure your kids are, are not spending all their time with games and TV. Um, and then getting immunizations is really important. A lot of our kids may be a little behind on their immunizations because we were a little reluctant to go to the pediatrician. There is absolutely no reason to do that. We don't want to see a recurrence of um, some of these horrible childhood diseases that we've eradicated. Immunization is the best way to boost the immune system. It is especially important to get the flu shot this season. The flu looks like coronavirus. We do not want to add the stress to stress and anxiety by having you know, an, an illness that kind of looks like coronavirus and wondering what it is. Um, and the flu, vac the flu is probably more of a risk for children, as far as we know right now, than the novel coronavirus is. Thank you. So that brings up a point. Um, that a few of the parents wrote in about and actually asked as well. When their child gets an asthma attack and they cough, is the school going to send them home every time? Are they going to have to quarantine? Do we know what's going to happen with that? Or if their allergies act up and they have a runny nose, what, what's going to happen? So, Dr. You know, Trout, go ahead. Uh, you know it's, it's just really important to maintain good control of your symptoms. So if you're taking your asthma medication and your allergy medications, you're gonna minimize the coughing, the sneezing, the runny nose. Um, that is just really, really important. We can't answer the question about what an individual school is gonna do. That's a judgment call, and that's usually up to the school nurse. But I think being responsible parents, we're gonna to have to be a little stricter about keeping our kids home when it's questionable whether they might be getting sick or not. And we're going to have to accept that as a new normal. 
Yeah, I agree. As a pediatrician, we're really concerned about our role in sending kids back to school. And we're hoping that the school districts give us some guidance as to what they want. Because, you know, if your child has a fever and it's better in 48 hours, like when can they go back? What can they do? We can't tell by looking at you whether you do or don't have coronavirus. Even the tests, you know, are only so good and it depends on what day of the illness you give them at. So, you know, even though those aren't exact. So I'm hoping and we're all hoping that we get some guidance from the Department of Health that will be more global for all the school districts instead of everybody kind of making up their own rules as they go along. I'd like to add something to that as well. Um, I was in on a conference with some school nurses in the area and they had reported that less than 50% of the students with asthma have an asthma action plan with the school nurse um, holding their medications and uh, the protocol. So I think it's really important that parents know that their child with asthma has to go to school with an asthma action plan and the school nurse should have the medication on hand if the child cannot administer themselves. I think it's really important to emphasize that. Great. So Erica, so this is all new, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but okay. do you know how somebody can make an appointment with you or Michelle? So there's a couple of different ways. Um, if you're allied patients, you can call your office directly and they can schedule a telemedicine visit for you. Um, you can also go to the Allied Physicians Group website and there is a link which will be posted at the end of this uh, webinar um, and in the follow-up email. And you just click on the link and you can make the appointment right from there. Great, to, um, to further elucidate, if you go to the alliedphysiciansgroup.com under the education tab, you'll see ACE, Asthma Control Education, and that's where you can click to make an appointment. Um, and I don't know how they decide between Michelle and, and Erica, or if it's timing or, or whatever that is, but I know that you're in good hands either way. So we are coming up to the hour. Kevin, do you wanna give us the takeaway? Sure, I just put up the slide. Someone wanna read it? Uh, sure, Dr. Strauss, you wanna read it? Okay, so um, in summary, children with asthma can attend school with no increased risk of coronavirus. I think the decision about whether to send your child or not, probably you should look at other factors such as who else is in your home who could get sick. But I think the general strong feeling from all the pediatricians and specialists on this panel is that the benefits that kids get out of attending school far outweighs the perceived risks at this time. Um, cat, keeping asthma under good control is essential. You shouldn't look to treat asthma attacks, you should tr look to prevent them. And the best way to do that is to arrange a visit with your doctor in advance, make sure your kid is on the right medication. Um, telemedicine is the new age of medicine. It makes it so much easier to get in contact with your doctor it really is a virtual house call. And being aggressive with the preventative medications, the steroid inhalers is the way to go. Um, they're, they're really the benefit to risk ratio is tremendous. Finally, wearing masks does not increase the risk of an asthma exacerbation or flare. Talk with your child, have them pick out a mask that's appropriate for them, send them to school with several because they're gonna lose them, they're gonna get dirty. And finally, Get the flu vaccine for your entire family. So thank you all for listening to this webinar. It's been an absolute pleasure on our part. Feel free to call us if you have questions or concerns. Thank you to the panel, I appreciate it. Um, just to reiterate, we will be sending out a link to this webinar as well as some information, plus a link to our uh, new ACE page where you can get in contact with an asthma educator. Thanks again, panel. And uh, we'll see you all get an invite for the next one on September 3rd, which is gonna be focused on anxiety and going back to school. That should be another great webinar. I appreciate everybody's time and have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye.